Welcome to our show, Empower Your Life. I'm your host, Cindy Marie. Our next guest, he's an award-winning entrepreneur, a TEDx speaker, a mindset mentor, a leadership coach for celebrities, change makers, uh, CEOs. He's also an author for the number one international bestseller on self-leadership entitled Prison Break, which we're going to cover that on this episode. He is obviously wearing many hats, so I'm very excited for you to hear and listen to his inspiring stories and many other valuable information. So without further ado, may I welcome to you our next guest, Jason Goldberg, also known as JG. Hi, Jason or JG. (laughs) I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for that awesome introduction. And then, of course, I'm literally wearing a hat today. So however many hats I was already wearing, (laughs) we have to add one more hat into the the mix. Uh, But yeah, I'm so excited to be here and to have this conversation with you today. Yes, yes. So how are you? How's the weather? How's LA? How's everything with you? You know, LA is, I've been here for about four and a half years. I moved from the East coast of the U.S. about four and a half years ago. And I'll tell you, it's, I mean, it's, there's a lot of crazy stuff in LA for sure, but the weather is just one of the most amazing things. Like it's, Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, something like 65 degrees uh, Fahrenheit right now. I'm not sure where that is in Celsius, but it's just pretty much beautiful all year round. So I am very, very blessed and very grateful to live here. That's good. I have visited LA once and that's pretty much, it's just one day. Just, just one day. <laughs> I think you need to spend some more time here for sure. We can swap. You come stay at my house. I'll go stay at yours so I can go check out Spain and awesome. it'll be perfect. I love that. I love that. I love that deal. Okay. For everyone who don't know you yet, uh, can you can you share with us your story? Like how everything started from being a rapper. I want to include that. IT executive, entrepreneur, author, speaker, coach, mentor, and more. So could you share with us your story, how everything started? Yeah, yeah. I mean, depending how far you want to go back, I mean, just, you know, I, I was, I was, I, I'm an only child. I was raised by a single mother. So it was always just the two of us. My, my father left my mom when she was pregnant. As soon as he found out she was pregnant, he left. He never turned back. I never saw him, never saw a picture of him. He just disappeared out of our lives. I always say he was a professional magician that he just disappeared one day and never reappeared. Uh, and so, so, you know, growing up, it was just the two of us. And my mother, who I love, unconditionally and she's amazing you know she's she suffered a lot with with depression and with anxiety and and with a lot of those things and so from a very young age I picked up on that I I kind of uh, adopted her viewpoint of you know you know people kind of being out to get me and 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 uh and blaming the world for things and kind of being what I call now a prisoner of circumstance and what that means is you know I'm at the whim of what's going on in the news, who's in the White House, uh, the song on the radio that reminds me of my ex, the whatever the economy's doing, like my happiness and sadness are completely dictated based on what circumstances are going on around me. And that was just kind of how I lived my life. And, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, there's nothing wrong with my mom for having lived that way. She learned it from her parents and there was no one there to teach her something different. We don't learn this kind of stuff in school, unfortunately, a little more so now, but back then definitely not. And so what that ended up happening with me is that I developed a lot of stress and I developed a lot of depression and I developed a lot of anxiety and I was put on antidepressant medication, you know, prescription wow. medication from the time I was like 15, 16 years old and into my early thirties. Like I was on this stuff for, wow. forever yeah. and, and it got, it got really bad because the other way that it manifested itself with, with me was, was with, with weight, with physical weight. And so I became, I was kind of chunky as a kid. And then as I got older, I kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger to where I was 250 pounds when I was 15 years old, which is a very challenging time as a teenager in general. But then you add being like the fat kid on top of it. And I was picked on a lot and and things like that. And then up to 332 pounds in my late twenties. Uh, and you know, I was I was the director of engineering and operations for a tech firm. That was my, my tech background, uh, and and you know making a lot of money and and had like a beautiful house and car and all these things. And I still had suicidal thoughts, and I was still terribly depressed. And there were times in the morning when I would get ready for work that my clothes fit me so poorly because I was so overweight that I would just drop to the ground in my closet and just cry. Like I would just I was so sad every day, and and so it wasn't until I had this kind of moment that happened, this, this wake up call. And I had had tons of wake up calls before that, but this was the first one I listened to. I had this wake up call. I was, I was 29 years old. I was in that, that IT consulting position. 
And I, and I write about this in my book, Prison Break, it's the first chapter of the book, where I just had this experience that happened. And I won't tell the whole story here unless you want me to. I wanna, for, for time, I wanna save time so we can get to even better stuff. But there was, there was something that happened that day where it really like woke me up to the fact that the reason that I was so overweight, the reason I was so depressed, the reason I was so anxious was because I had a fundamental misunderstanding of how the world works right? Yeah. That I don't need to be a prisoner of circumstance all the time, but there's another option. And that other option is self-leadership, which was what Prison Break, the book is all about. Right. So, so I kind of, so professionally, that was when I really started diving into personal growth in my late twenties. I left uh, my last corporate job in 2011. And I had a couple of other startups, uh, one in the transportation space and one in the, uh, in the technology space, working with uh, NASA and the space shuttle program. And then I got into coaching full-time, uh, like end of 2013, beginning, beginning of 2014. And I've been coaching and speaking and teaching ever since. Awesome. That's, uh, that's like uh, compressing the stories into like, oh. Yeah, <laughs> the idea that's is the very there. short version. Yeah, 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 the short version. <laughs> but the idea is there. You, you pinpoint a very important to discuss right now is really like the prisoner circumstances, which will uh, lead me to the next question. So. This is very relevant, very relevant to everyone. And we are encountering, we're experiencing this. I mean, maybe we are good at catching this, uh, but the rest of the people are having a hard time with that. So my next question is that how can the rest of the people can catch that prisoner mindset and then also to shift into the uh, self-leader mindset? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is a great question. The, the interesting thing is, you know, my, my definition even of self-leadership has has evolved. I, I wrote mm. the book in 2016. And, and so 2016, you know, now we're looking at you know, coming up on six years. It'll be six years this year that it came out. And, and, and my definition has changed. Fundamentally, it's still about personal responsibility. But as it's evolved, it's really, it's really about waking up. And so, you know, you can't, I always say you can't get out of bed until you wake up right? You, ha you have to be aware of what's going on and then you can make a change. And so the interesting thing is that the, the intelligence system that we have, uh, whatever your beliefs are, whether, you know, whether it's just biology and physiology, if you're an atheist, which is totally fine, uh, whether it's God, it's spirit, it's the universe, whatever you think created this thing that we now walk around in this meat suit that we walk around in every day, there is, a, there is an intelligent system that's built in that tells us when something's off, right? We know, like we know what stress feels like. We know what anxiety feels like. We know what depression feels like. We yeah. know what these things feel like. We also know what joy and happiness and all that stuff yeah. feels like. But but what I'm saying there is that like in the same way, if, if, if we were talking right now about identifying hunger, right? And somebody asked me, well, how do you know? How, how can we tell the people at home how they can start practicing uh, noticing when they need to eat? Well, they know. It's just the system tells them, oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I'm thirsty. Like, oh, I'm stressed. So the system is telling you. So that's your first step is to, to listen to the system. When the system tells you something, treat that like it's an early warning detection system. Just like on your car, you have a little, a little light that comes on the dashboard when you're low on fuel, when you're low on petrol. Yeah. And, and, it, and it tells you that because it wants you to, to make sure to know that you're running low on something. The light doesn't come on when you're out of gas, right? The yeah. light comes on with still 30 or 40 miles in the tank. So it's just very gently saying, hey, just so you know, nothing to be alarmed about, but we're a little bit low on fuel. So you may want to pull over and get some more fuel at some point soon, right? So it's just a very gentle reminder. So when we feel the stress or we feel the anxiety or we feel heaviness or discomfort or whatever it is, that's just that light on the dashboard saying, hey, everything's okay. But we may want to look into this and see what's causing this in this moment. Yeah, I, I love that you 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 made it an example like the flashing light, because I think we know that the challenge now is that why people don't shift. So yeah, I that's one thing that I want to ask you because obviously right now as we growing as we are learning improving ourselves and we are very aware with ourselves but there are a lot of people they know they felt it but they just just trying to understand why they don't do anything do you do you know any reason behind that <laughs> Oh, of course. I mean, it's the human condition and, and I'm not immune from this either. I, I do the same yeah. thing where there are times 
where I, I know I need to make a decision on something or that I know I need to make a change on something and it doesn't immediately happen. I, I still will, will fight it or resist it or, or have uh, just have some, some disconnect from that. And, and a lot of what it comes down to, depending on the situation and depending on the person, but a lot of what it comes down to is just that we have this, we have such a tight grip on our identity. Mm -hmm. And so if we make a change, that's a threat to our identity. And right. inside, again, the system inside doesn't know the difference between the death of our physical body, body. and the death of an identity, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to know that on the other side of that identity, we can still be safe. Because even when we're in a, you know, in this, a very easy, simple example, people who stay in jobs six months, a year, two years, five years, 10 years longer than they should, right? They know, they feel it like it's out of alignment or it's not my highest contribution or I'm super bored or I don't believe in this company or whatever it is. We know and then we don't we don't leave the job. Why? Oh. Well, even though we hate this job or we disagree with it or or we think there's something better, whatever it is, we, whatever we're not a fan of this, whatever that is, at least I know what to expect. It's safe, right? It's safe. I know it sucks, but at least I know what I'm getting into. It's much harder, it, it's, it's very easy to think about what we will lose. It's very hard to think about what we will gain when we make a change. Yeah. So working through that identity of who would I be without this job? Who would I be without this relationship? Who would I be without these things that I wanna let go of or that I wanna transform through? That's the deeper work because once we realize that we are safe and we are enough, regardless of what identity we're living into right now, those decisions, those choices happen a lot more easily. Yeah. Well, I guess it boils down to being safe or to change to become a better person. I think that's the always like <laughs> the challenge yeah. that everyone's facing right now. Yeah, it's it's a it's a waking up to truth, right? Because it's it's I, I'm not even worried so much about people becoming better people. Like it's great. Like, you know, we should we should work on ourselves and do all that and everything else. But but I just want to get to truth. Right. Yeah. I just, I just want to get to truth. I want to wake up to truth. And so a part of this is recognizing if, if I'm watching a movie on TV and, and I'm watching somebody play a bank robber, right. On TV, I may get sucked into that movie sometimes and think that it's real, but at some point the movie's over. And then I remember, Oh, that's an actor playing a bank robber. They're not actually a bank robber. Like I saw them in another movie, you know, 10, 10 days ago and they were, it was a love story and they weren't a bank robber. So what happened? So it's noticing that like in the same way we see the identity of a bank robber in a movie, it's the same thing we can see in ourselves. We can wake up to the fact that when I'm playing the role, like if I was in a movie, if I was playing the role of Jason, the overwhelmed, stressed out entrepreneur, mm -hmm. I can look at that and say, oh, that's an identity. That's not yeah. me. Yeah. That's an identity. And so when I really realize that I am not that identity, I'm just looking at truth and truth will have me see, oh, it's actually much more peaceful over here when I don't confuse who I am with that identity that's over there. Yeah, well, I hope everyone hears and listen to that, that what matters is your truth because we can always pretend what we feel outside, but we can never fool ourselves. So if you feel like there's a calling of change. I don't know. I mean, for me and for you, I think the awareness is, is something that really challenging to work on, I would say, right? <laughs> and it's not everyone's cup of tea. That's why a lot of people would, would prefer to stay where they are because it's safe. Everyone knows you as who you are that way. And you're not going to uh, like thinking, oh, maybe I will lose all of these people which obviously for me, that's the case because I'm trying to get away from who I used to be. And obviously we are on that journey. But anyway, I think what you pinpoint is very important that as long as we know the truth, whatever, wherever you are, then that's that be it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean just because you know that, you know, just because you, you understand that concept, that it means you'll never experience heaviness or sadness yeah. or anxiety. You still, it's just the human condition. But the more often we can realize what's really going on, it's like if I'm if I'm sitting with you and I'm really upset and you go, what's wrong? And I say, well, I'm just, I'm so sad. Like I, I, I wanna do jumping jacks, but I can't do jumping jacks. And I just wish I could do jumping jacks. And I love jumping jacks. And I'm just so sad that I can't do jumping jacks. And then you look at me and you go, well, yeah, but your leg is broken. And I go, oh. Oh, that's why I can't do jumping jacks. 
okay, well now I'm not gonna be as hard on myself because my leg is broken. Like I'm not supposed to be able to do jumping jacks, but at some point my leg will heal. If I let it heal, it'll heal. And then I can do jumping jacks again in the future. So it's just that noticing of like when things start feeling really heavy and sad and off, it's not the world out to get me. It doesn't mean my life is over. It doesn't mean I suck. It means that maybe I have the spiritual equivalent of a broken leg for a little while. And the more I can just accept that and not resist it, the faster it heals and goes away. Love that. The more you notice and accept it, the faster that it will heal away. Awesome. Yeah. So moving to the next question. Um, I, 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 I heard this or I listened to one of the podcasts that you've been interviewed and also in in your website about playful, joyful, and easy state. So for all of us that don't understand that, that statement or the approach that you're doing, can you elaborate with us? What does that mean and how does it help or make you as a high performer? Yeah, no, I, I, this is, I mean, this is a big part of what I believe. And it's just, I feel like we've been sold. I definitely was sold a, a lie that I had to be serious to be successful. Right. Like, and that's, that was what I, I don't know about you, but growing up, I always heard like, you know, you better get serious about your health and you better get serious about your school. And if you are, were a serious entrepreneur, you'd be doing this. And if you ever want to be in a serious relationship, you should do this. And for me, language is very important. And I noticed in my system that the word serious always feels very contracting, like constricting. Yeah. I don't feel creative. I don't like, nobody says like, you got to get serious. And I go, awesome. I feel so open and creative. I can't wait to figure like it. It just never felt that way to me. It always felt like, oh no, like time's running out. I got to figure this out. What's wrong with me? Why haven't I figured this out? And then you notice the flip side of this is that when you're in a lighter, more playful place, you tend to come up with better ideas to solve okay. whatever the problems are that you're facing, or you notice that there are not even problems that need to be solved anymore once you stop being so serious. And so what I've shifted is, is, and I even said this to you in the very beginning, when, when we were talking about before you started recording and we were talking about the, uh, like researching your guests beforehand and how I was acknowledging you for like doing that research. And if you, if you notice, and maybe you didn't notice this, but I said, I wanted to acknowledge you for the sincerity that you brought to that process, not the seriousness. I didn't say that you took it seriously. I said that you were sincere about it. Because Alan Watts talks about that the opposite of being serious doesn't mean we don't care about anything and we're just flippant and we don't have any goals and we're aimless and we just get drunk and high all day. Like that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about shifting from the heaviness of serious into the intentionality of sincerity, right? I sincerely want to bring all of my love and attention and, and focus to the thing in front of me, but I don't want to make it too significant. I don't want to take it too seriously. I love it. I, I think I would agree with you because especially as we grow older, you know, people will be like, oh, come on, you're not at your age to play that way. And I'm like, because sometimes I have this tendency, even with my husband and with my mother-in-law, in the middle of nowhere, as long as I hear music, I will just dance. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> and my, my mother-in-law and my husband will be like, laughing at me like you you're really someone it's like yeah this is fun what it's fun it, yeah. it makes your heart full and you know makes you feel like uh kids or baby whatever that be but also even even uh working you know i mean working is always serious and sometimes i i have to agree with you that when you are playful when you're in easy state high chance that you you also get that creative ideas instead of yeah. like just too focused but we are the same how we grew up this is what we see that you know the <laughs> the older you get you have to be serious that's that's how you gain respect absolutely and, and it's and it's so funny because i think everybody like if everybody had the permission like if it became a mandate in a company like let's say you worked in a big fortune 1000 company and they said uh, okay team we have a new rule uh unless you are playful at least four days a week, you are not eligible for promotions anymore, right? Then I bet the entire company would be like, oh, we're allowed to be playful. Not only that, we're incentivized to be playful. Not only that, the only way we can move up in the company is to be playful. I feel like everybody would mysteriously be able to tap back into their playfulness like that. But because we've had it kind of beaten into us that, oh, this is, you, you, when, if you're serious, that's how you move forward. Then we don't feel like we have permission to do it. Now, again, 
This is why sincerity is so important because in my business, uh, you know, in, in coaching people or in any of the businesses that I've had that I brought playfulness into, I had to make sure sincerity was there as well because I don't, I want people to understand like, listen, the work we're doing together, it's important to me, right? I want you to know it's important. I'm not, I'm not saying like, oh, I'm just going to screw around and we're not going to do, you know, we're not going to make any progress but bringing a more lighthearted approach. That's really what it is, even more than play. It's just bringing a lighter approach, bringing more, more lightheartedness into your world. And, and that makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the beauty of when you set up your own business, you can create the environment that you want. So this is the, 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 the kind of approach that you, you, you're having with your team. And that's wonderful because yeah, creativity is always on the more relaxed and openness and sincerity as long as it's there. So awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Next question, which I I am also interested in to find out. <laughs> I'm sure the rest of the people would also uh, be curious. What does Jason Goldberg or JG self leadership morning routine look like <laughs> yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty simple i don't i don't have uh it's nothing too complex so i i wake up at 6 a.m uh pretty much by default now like i don't even really need the alarm and i was never like a morning person i was not somebody who loved getting up at six o'clock in the morning but i practiced it over time and, and eventually now i just even on the weekends i'm up at 6 6 30 so i wake up at six and then the first thing I do is either my meditation, which I do 30 minutes of meditation every morning. Mm -hmm. um, I either do my meditation or I do some kind of reading or learning. So I, sometimes I'll swap the order. Sometimes I do the learning first. Sometimes I do the meditation first, but I do those two things. Uh, once I'm done with that, which takes, uh, usually that's like maybe uh, an hour, hour and 15 minutes for, for that total. Uh, then I get, I get ready and I go to the gym. And so I work out for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, depending on what I have going on that day. Uh, and then I come home, I have my green juice. I do athletic greens. I don't know if you know this company, but uh, I'd use it. It's a green powder. So I have my athletic greens. I take my vitamins uh, and then I go get ready for the day. I take my shower and I get ready. And usually my first call is around 10 AM. Uh, and that's kind of my morning routine, really simple, but it's, uh, but it's worked really well for me. Yes. I think um, the the powerful routine there would be like obviously waking up early morning and then you have the meditation and exercise. I mean, I've learned this uh, over time and I make sure that it's the same. I'm the same with you, like either or, but as long as these three practices or three steps for morning routine will be completed, then I'm good. So for me, yeah. it's like more on the, I started with exercise. And then I start with the with, uh, next one will be uh, uh, journaling and then, uh, you know, uh, feeding your brain with uh, with the information, with all of this positive information, like podcasts, reading book and all of that. So because I think you would agree that it actually create and make your day better than, you know, starting with a cell phone or social media or whatever. You agree on oh, that? Oh, yeah. oh 100%. Yeah, I, I try not to touch my phone uh, for at least the first hour of the day. I, I keep it on airplane mode just completely. So I, I, I'll still open my phone uh, if I'm like read a Kindle book, but they're downloaded to my phone. So I don't have to worry about having internet for that. So I leave, I leave it on, on airplane mode. But yeah, taking that first hour of the day to not look at the phone, it's, it's such a beneficial thing to do. It's super simple, but it's take it takes time to practice that waking up in the morning and then also whatever like meditation, affirmation, gratitude, and then I think exercise is super, super important. I would agree. Yeah, yeah and, you, and you can't and you can't get it wrong either. So like some people will say, Oh, well, I, I can't wake up at 6 a.m. So that means I shouldn't do anything. No, wake up whatever time you wake up and they go, well, I can't do 30 minutes of meditation. So don't do 30 yeah. minutes of meditation, do five minutes, like whatever it is, you're going to feel a benefit. And when you feel the benefit and you get the win, you want to do more of it, right? Like anything else mm -hmm. that you're getting good, a good feedback loop on, even if the feedback loop is from yourself, you want to do more of that. So just baby step it out. I remember in the beginning, I, I wanted to do 5 a.m. for a while and, and I did it for years. I don't need to now because I can get everything done in the morning if I wake up at six, mm -hmm. but I wanted to be like in the 5 a.m. club. And I definitely was not a 5 a.m. club person. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to wake up at 5 a.m. and I wanted to go to the gym. That was going to be the regimen that I really wanted to stick to. So what I did initially was 
I woke up at 5 a.m. This was probably for the better part of a week. Every morning I woke up at 5 a.m. I stood up out of bed, like got out of bed. And then I went back to sleep because I proved to myself that I could at least get up and get out of bed at 5 a.m. in the morning, right? But then I went back to sleep. So it was a very easy thing. Then the next week I put my gym clothes out and at 5 a.m. I woke up and I put on my gym clothes and then I went back to sleep. So I was proving to myself. I was just moving myself forward it. little by little. So by the third week, it was super easy to get up at 5 a.m. because I've been doing it for two weeks. I already knew that I could put on my gym clothes. And now it was a matter of just walking out the door and going to the gym. So it's a lot easier to baby step that stuff than to go from zero to 100 in one day. I love that. I mean, that's actually a very powerful tip there for a lot of people giving reasons or excuses that I can't start like that. I think you you pinpoint the, the, the good steps. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, baby steps. All baby steps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's literally baby, baby, baby step. <laughs> Super baby step. I mean, like the babyest of all baby steps. I love it. I love it. I think uh, I will use that for those people making an excuse with every yeah. everything. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, you know, and I get it. People have kids and they have all these different things, yeah. but you know, this is, this is another thing where it's just, you know, the, the sacrifice and I don't have kids. And so I, I, I am in no way, shape or form saying, I know what it's like, but what I, what I do know to be true from all the people I've coached with kids is that when they start doing this for themselves and they stop sacrificing themselves because they think they have to, because of their kids, yeah. they notice that they actually have a better relationship with their kids or their spouse because they're prioritizing themselves first, yeah. right? So that way there's no resentment. So if you're constantly sacrificing what you need, and this, and this is not, this doesn't mean you're going off and, you know, getting three hour massages in the middle of the day while your kids are sitting at home starving. I don't, I don't mean yeah. that, but if you are prioritizing your own well being first, you won't have resentment towards your spouse or your kids or your job because it feels like they're just taking, taking, taking from you. You start by giving to yourself first and then it actually makes you want to give more to other people. I would agree with you on that because the moment that you become a parent, uh, the initial responsibility is to give your full time to your kids. And I always say this to myself as well that you know, once we have a family, then I, I, and I am always telling this to my husband that I have to have my me time. Mm -hmm. So I, I wake up early. So I have my me time and he respected on that. But at the same time in exchange, because he, he respect that space, I give him full because I have already energy on my own. And I think it's, it's super powerful for a lot of people to hear that it's, it's nothing bad to be giving yourself a space because a lot of people would say, I mean, in, 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 in Asia, uh, we have this culture, you know, once you become a parent, you totally sacrifice everything. But obviously our generation is evolving, right? And then it, it, it's the same on, on what you said earlier that it's just that we being sold differently, right? Yes. Had, we our culture is different now we, we becoming understanding that it's not working the same way anymore for us because we understand that when we sacrifice too much our our cup is br broken there's nothing that we can give to ourselves so for our parents out there that's a good tip that you know it's not being selfish because uh, giving yourself a self-care is actually very, very powerful to share your love and everything to to your family members so thank you for highlighting that yeah, and I'm glad that you have that arrangement with your husband as well, where like he understands the power of you having that. And, and that's that's the power of having really good open communication with your significant other, right? They're not going to read your mind. But if you just come and say, listen, this is what I need. And, and in exchange, I can make sure to give you what you need and whatever that looks like for you, like just having that conversation, you'd be surprised how many spouses actually really support you doing that because they know it's going to make you a better a better mom, a better wife, a better whatever. Yeah, so going going to relevant question on that, you know, to have a self care, to have this good energy within you. So, how do you practice, or how do you keep yourself optimistic? And what you can also share discipline or practices to people out there to keep themselves optimistic. Yeah, you know, for me, I'm just I'm such a fan of 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 reminders, right? Like I, I say this all the time as as coaches we're pretty much in the reminder business, 
that's really kind of the business we're in. Like we, you know, pe we teach people things or, you know, they, they learn things or they read things. And then we need reminders because it's not how we were raised. It's not, you know, it's, it's a totally different language than what we were raised with. And so if you grew up in a house that spoke Spanish, you're not stupid for not knowing how to speak French. You were just never exposed to it. And so it's going to take time for you to learn French. And then at some point you realize in any given moment, oh, I can either respond to this moment in Spanish or in French. You notice that you have both, you have access to both, right? But initially you don't have access to both. You have Spanish and you have broken French, right? There's only so much you can do with the broken French. So it's a matter of really having reminders. So the reason I say that is because one of the things that I do that I've never, I, I haven't encountered anybody else that, that does this yet. I'm sure there are people that do it, but I, I, every time I tell people, they go, wow, I've never heard of that before. Is that a lot of times my, my morning reading uh, there's a lot of people who, and this, there's nothing wrong with this. I think this is awesome. Uh, who are, they want, they read like 52 books a year or whatever it is like a book a week. Some people more like a hundred books a year or whatever. And I think that's amazing. Like I I've never come anywhere close to that. What I realized for myself is that I can become what I call an insight junkie, right? Like, Oh man, that was a great insight. I need the next one. You know, give, give me the next book. Give me the next podcast. Give me the next, whatever. And I'm like, I just need more insights. But when I really slow that down, I oftentimes have not embodied the insight that I heard. It was knowledge. It was information I'm like, oh, that's cool. But I didn't put it into practice. It just gets stored in my mind as more information, more knowledge. So one of the things I do is that when I come across an idea or a concept that I really want to embody that resonates with me and I really want to embody it, I will go back every morning over and over and over again and keep reading that same insight. There was a time where I read one page of a book every day for, I think it was two or three weeks. I only read that page over and over again. So I would literally sit there and read it for 15 or 20 minutes every morning for two weeks because I really wanted to get that. I didn't want it just to be in one ear and out the other. And so that's been really helpful for me. And then it gets to a point where I'm reading the thing over and over. And then it gets to a point where it doesn't feel uh, as powerful anymore, which is my sign that I've already embodied it. Right. If it doesn't feel like it's revolutionary anymore, it means I've embodied it. So for me, I'm not about reading all a bunch of different things, which is fine if you are, but that, that's not my thing. I go back to either my own insights because I have a whole folder in my email box that is just insights I've had throughout the day or from a coaching session or from reading a thing. And then those are in my words, right? Those are my insights. Those, those are the words that spoke to my soul. So instead of worrying about reading a bunch of other people's words, I want to read the words that I wrote to myself because of what I read from somebody yeah. else in their world, right? Those are my words. So of course they're made for me. And yeah. so that, that's what I do every morning. I'm rereading my own insights. I'm rereading passages and books that I really want to embody. And just, I stick with that until I feel like I'm ready to move to a new concept. I love that. I love that. Uh, that's, that's, that's actually, uh, I always say this to, I mean, when I post uh, some content that, you know, it's about experimenting everyone approaches in life. And then really try to do that on yourself and then see which one will work. So, so this is why I think it's, it's, it's very great to, to know your approach and being optimistic is that you, you, you take one of those passages or part of the books and then you you keep on reading and reading until you embody that. Maybe with a lot of people that will work and I will try that. But usually what I do is that I will write down as well. And then that will be like, you know, we call it also like mantra, but obviously as you have, <laughs> you have uh, collected so many, then it's, it's very unlikely you're gonna memorize everything. But when you read and read and read, <laughs> then you will slowly embody that. And that's, that's truly also a way to keep you optimistic and positive energy. And thank you for sharing that. I think um, never have I ever uh, heard that from anyone that I have interviewed. So thank you. That's You're very, very, very <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, very powerful because um, I think right now, I mean, as you know, that the purpose of, of this, uh, of this show is really to inspire and motivate a lot of people, especially like very overwhelmed, you know, because information is out there. And then, you know, you have this idol that's just too far to, <laughs> to reach. And then yeah. that's, the, that's the, the, the approach is really to, to interview people like you that, hey, we can reach out to these people and look at what they're doing. So I am also a human being like him. 
uh, he happens to be all, already building these practices and disciplines in, in life, it means that I'm also capable on that. 100%. 100%. Yeah. It's, all the, it's all the same experience. Like it's, there, there's nothing, there's nothing that I do or that I am that isn't available to everybody else. If it weren't available to everybody else, I wouldn't have access to it. It's not, I'm not that special. Like it's everybody has access to this stuff, right? And so, and I don't mean that, you know, some people uh, don't live in situations where maybe they don't have as much access to certain things, but when it comes to a way of being and, and mm. understanding mm. truth, we all have access to that. And so it's, so it's really this practice of going back to waking up. It's really this practice of, you know, noticing as much as possible that every experience that we have is, is birthed inside of our awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing can exist unless we're aware, right? If we're in a coma, we're not aware of anything, right? Although that there's science that maybe shows we are still aware, but, but for the most part, we're not, we're not aware when we're in a coma. Otherwise we are awareness. That's all we are full stop. And so one of the, the differences between me and maybe somebody who's still, still looking at waking up to this process is that I have the understanding that every wave that comes up in the ocean, every wave of, of anger, every wave of sadness, every wave of depression, whatever those things are, they exist independent of the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. If I am the ocean and my consciousness is the entire ocean, the waves are not the ocean. The waves are contained inside of the ocean, but they're not the ocean. And the beautiful thing about really looking at life through this metaphor of, of the ocean and the waves is that there is no wave that can come up in the ocean that can damage the ocean. The ocean cannot be hurt by any waves. And in the same way with us, no matter what the wave comes up of sadness or anxiety or whatever else, it can't actually hurt us. Right. Mm. So the more we recognize that the waves are just a part of the consciousness that we're aware of, then the less the waves have to impact us. And so that's the thing that I'm constantly anchoring back into for myself. And when other people start seeing that for themselves as well, they notice a big shift in their lives. I just want to summarize uh, the pieces of, I think, very powerful from the entire in, uh, conversation that we have. You started with noticing noticing within yourself, acknowledging and understanding that each one of us encountering just different angle, you know, you see it in different angle, but it's, all, it's the same. And then because you understand uh, how you work on your own, the understanding and the awareness is already built. It doesn't mean that the rest of the people won't be able to get there as well. So these are the things that I have come up on the summary that all things that you have shared to us or to me right now it's it's wonderful noticing acknowledging understanding and then really practicing i love that i think you, yeah you summarized it perfectly and, and and also just to say one thing there that i am definitely not there i don't think there's a there to get to right i'm a constant work in progress i'm always doing these things too so don't i don't want anybody to think that they're supposed to aspire to be where i am because i am nowhere I am just in what I'm in now and I'm constantly learning and growing and everything else. So it's, I think it's good to know that it's a never ending trek. There's not somewhere you get to, and then you're just happy forever. It's that's the human condition. And I think that's great because it actually, it normalizes, it levels the playing field for everybody. So there's nobody who's I'm up here and somebody else is down here. We're all right here. We're just all traveling on the same path together. I love it. I love it for, um, for everyone out there, just so you know, I was telling uh, JG or Jason earlier that I was, I'm, I'm really nervous to speak with him. But then, you know, as you get having a conversation, like it, it's just different feeling when you get to know that person that making you feel that, hey, no, we're the same. Yeah. I feel you, you feel me. So nothing to be nervous. And I love that. So I want to, again, acknowledge you on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. And, and you, you didn't seem nervous to me at all. You seem like <laughs> now, an old yes. pro for years and years. <laughs> so totally now, yeah. So there you go, everyone. It's amazing. A, a very short yet very profound with a lot of juiciest information there that I think a lot of you listeners and viewers out there get, um, you know, you get to practice. And really, really like going back to understanding, noticing yourself that it's a journey right you might see that other person already ahead of you but it's still a journey you don't you don't see where he started or she started so 
another thing for that to add on is really it's it's not so healthy to compare our, ourselves to out uh, other people out there because we don't know their journey <laughs> especially social media do not do not compare yourself to people on social media that they, they are all including myself typically sharing most of the best moments but guarantee there are not so good moments behind the scenes because they are human and it doesn't mean that they have to share every intimate detail of their lives but just know that we all struggle with stuff we all suffer with stuff it's the human condition so again another example of us all being the same yeah well there you go thank you thank you so much jason so For everyone out there that would love to see, I would love for them to see your wrapping out there post. <laughs> and <laughs> also, uh, of course, understand uh, your coaching uh, program and also uh, the book. So where can we find you? Yeah, so you can go to my website. Uh, the website is thejasongoldberg.com. The, the, whatever you want to say it, thejasongoldberg.com. Uh, and I'm also the Jason Goldberg on all social media channels. Instagram is where I hang out the most. Uh, so there's links to get my book for free there and you can check out all my content there. And that's the best place to connect with me. Awesome. So there you go, everyone. For everyone who resonates and feeling related to this conversation or on this episode, and you would like to know more about Jason Goldberg and what he has to offer, you since he has many hats you know he can even help you with other things <laughs> and um uh, inexperienced so he is a type of person that will really get a message you back if you go into message and get to know him better so don't hesitate to message him right yeah absolutely for sure <laughs> that's how we can <laughs> so there you go everyone thank you thank you so much uh for this wonderful uh conversation if you find this episode super helpful and valuable don't forget to share it over to the people that will be benefiting this because our website then will grow organically and don't forget to support or to follow and follow or check the website of jason goldberg uh, at facebook and website and you have instagram instagram yep instagram is the best yep same so there you go feel free to check out and then follow him and then feel free to message him Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. And uh, thank really, you, really thank appreciate you. it. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy that interview and I hope you find it inspiring and motivating. Remember, stay optimistic and keep taking action slowly but surely for your big dreams. Thank you once again, and I'll see you on the next episode here at Empower Your Life.